Less than three years after it hosted football's World Cup, South Africa is once again in the spotlight. This time staging the Africa Cup of Nations, the continent's biggest sporting event. But can this tournament boost Africa's image abroad? Africa and the legacy of the Cup of Nations. This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Hazem Seeker. Well, as the Africa Cup of Nations comes to a close, all eyes are on Burkina Faso and Nigeria, who will play for the right to be named Champions of Africa on Sunday. They earned their place in the final after beating tournament favourites Ghana last week. Nigeria's much-praised performance at this tournament has brought back memories of its glory days during the 1990s when the team dominated African football. For rank underdogs Burkina Faso, this is only the second time they've made it past the first round. So getting to the final in itself was a great accomplishment, though they will certainly be looking to go all the way on Sunday. But away from the action on the field, there are plenty of other winners and losers. Who are they? And is the game heading in the right direction? Well, South Africa has already uh, had many of the facilities needed to host these kind of events because it invested billions of dollars for the World Cup in 2010. And a report on that spending was released in November. It said that South Africa spent more than $3 billion on the World Cup. Just over $1 billion was spent on building and upgrading stadiums alone. But some of those stadiums have been underused or are losing money. Around $1.3 billion went to improving roads, rail and air links in the country. That's money the government says has had a long-term impact for South Africans. And though there are no definitive figures on how much South Africa earned from the event, the report said the World Cup left an intangible legacy and changed the country's international image. So is that legacy being felt by South Africans? Well, Andy Richardson has more now. A little piece of the 2010 Football World Cup has arrived in the village of Tsibela in South Africa's eastern free state. It's part of world governing body FIFA's effort to ensure that event does leave a lasting legacy. This specific project will see them give backing to 20 such community centres in various African countries, teaching not just football but also some lessons in life. We truly believe that interacting with these young people during football matches and uh, imparting the HIV messaging to them will very much be of assistance to them. To just bring the messages without a component of attraction is, is quite tough and we've, we've noticed difficulties through the years. And I think the concept of bringing us a, a tool that will bring people together and allow them to have fun at the same time as bringing these messages, I think this is, this is key. It's hard to boil down the wide-ranging impact of the World Cup here to statistics alone. But there are a few facts that fuel FIFA's critics. The World Cup generated over three and a half billion dollars worth of revenue and FIFA cleared over half a billion dollars worth of profit. By contrast, 80 million dollars is their commitment to their flagship World Cup legacy fund for community projects here in South Africa. It's FIFA's stated ambition to push and promote football in new parts of the world. The level of social as well as sporting responsibility that comes with that policy is a divisive issue. Some coaches still frustrated that while huge sums were spent on World Cup stadiums, more basic training facilities remain hard to come by. Sometimes it's hard to see how excellent can a, a player play and their skills is not easily executed in terms of the facility that you'll be using and also it's difficult for them to get together because some of the facilities, they are not uh, playable, I would say. But amongst the children here, there is a quiet chorus of approval. A simple facility born of the rather more complex legacy of Africa's first World Cup. Andy Richardson, Al Jazeera, Tabela, South Africa. Let's talk more about this now with uh, our three guests from Johannesburg. We have Carlos Amato, freelance football writer for The Mail and Guardian and The Times. Also from Johannesburg, Ibrahim Fakir, political analyst at the Electoral Institute for Sustainable Democracy in Africa. And from our studios in London, Kia Rednich, columnist for World Soccer magazine and author of the complete encyclopedia of soccer. Good to have you all with us 
Um, gentlemen, Kia Rednich, uh, I'll kick off with you then. Uh, obviously, with the, the 2010 World Cup being held in South Africa for the first time on the continent, there was a lot of talk back then of establishing a, a lasting legacy for the game in Africa. Here we are more than two and a half years later with South Africa again, playing host for the 2013 Cup of Nations. What kind of progress has been made on that front? Well, I think you can say that progress is being made and uh, slow progress is being made. The, the one thing I would say is that, uh, you know, Africa is a vast continent and it's very, uh, uh, I think, unreliable probably to extrapolate lessons from South Africa for the, for the entirety of Africa itself. Uh, what I do think happened particularly was that the, the image of African football got a terrific fillip from the presence of the World Cup there and, uh, you know, it was a basis and a foundation to take things forward. Then you're dependent on, to a large extent, uh, the people on the ground. Carlos Amato, it's, it's easy to, to look at this, I suppose, and say, uh, if you look at this from a, from a big picture perspective and say not, not enough is being done to uh, invest in the African game. But when you look at it from a local level, like the training center uh, in Andy's piece that we, that we just ran, is there not cause for optimism there, that, it, that this is where it really starts? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think a lot of uh, individual organizations and groups are doing great work. But I think the, the overall leadership of our football since the World Cup has been very weak. And uh, that's, the, that's the issue that bothers most fans here. Um, it seems that uh, since, since the two and a half years that we've, that we've been since the World Cup, there's been no tangible progress in guiding our football at the elite level. And that's what uh, people are concerned about. So there's a contradiction between what's happening on the ground and what's happening at the pinnacle. Ibrahim Fakir, how would you gauge the current state of African football then? Well, uh, you know, African football is diverse like the rest of Africa. And if, if you look at some of the countries, they've got players in the top ranked leagues, uh, some of them in top ranked clubs. Uh, of course, local football is beginning to develop. Uh, it's beginning to take on a greater air of flair. But I wouldn't necessarily say that our administration in football has improved. I mean, I think there are certain governance lessons we've learned. We've learned question, issues on our oversight, issues of sinking in infrastructure, investing in kind of creating creating sports fields, better administration and governance. But that, you know, unfortunately is at governmental level. It hasn't yet transposed, as Carlos is saying, within the football administration itself. Firstly, whether at the level of administration and management or whether at the level of uh, actual administration of the game, administering the league, uh, doing outreach, public relations, getting a bigger fan base, but also a better development of football at the actual grassroots level. Now, if you have uh, certain development initiatives taking place, Many of them are, in fact, taking place through non-governmental organizations, etc. What government has done through the legacy of the, of the Soccer World Cup, and some of it which will be left through the AFCON, is a little bit of infrastructure, but certainly that's nowhere near sufficient to be able to develop the game at grassroots. Well, you certainly bring up a, a, a good point there about uh, the fact that uh, a lot of more, more African players than ever are currently playing in, in the big European leagues at the moment. We'll talk more about that in just a moment, but let's just broaden this out now and talk about how African football has evolved uh, over the last 20 years or so. Some, uh, many people remember, of course, Cameroon's World Cup run back in 1990 as the, uh, the moment African football burst on to the world scene, as it were, as they became the continent's first team to reach the quarterfinals. But in the last few years, it's felt like it stagnated a little bit, barely a handful of African teams making it past the first round in a World Cup since then. That changed in 2010, though. The World Cup in South Africa was a boost to African pride, certainly, and it also saw Ghana get to the quarterfinals. And while top European clubs are constantly on the search for the next undiscovered talent in African football, there's a dark side to the rise of the sport in Africa, a growth in the trafficking of young men trying to make it professionally, many of whom are tricked by agents and end up living on the streets of Europe's capital. Let's talk more about that last point then, uh, Kia Rednich. I mean, uh, it, it is great, of course, to see lots of African uh, players uh, playing in the European leagues, as, as we talked about earlier. But uh, the problem as well is that, that that becomes a source of exploitation, doesn't it? Yes, it does. And I mean, it, to be fair, it's not only for African footballers, but African footballers are seem to be the victims the most because, uh, you know, Africa is more convenient to bring uh, 
kids across. Uh, I think one of the, the particular points, I mean, you talk about um, the level of ability of African players, no one's doubting this. Um, and, I, and I think one of the big disappointments on the field, if you look back at the World Cup in South Africa, is that Ghana were the only team, the only African team out of six to make progress, and that was disappointing. I think what uh, European clubs very much believe that there is a wealth of talent in Africa to be brought forward. And I think it's partly governance, partly administration, and partly control of uh, the way it works with agents uh, that really needs to be examined very, very carefully. And to be quite honest, uh, part of that is down to governance of the game and protection of the game, if you like, in Africa itself. Carlos Amato, are uh, African football footballers being exploited by European clubs? Uh, certainly not the very successful ones, um, and that is the incentive that uh, that drives so many young, vulnerable youngsters to, you know, to take risks in pursuit of of fame and riches. So, it's it's a difficult situation. I mean, even in South Africa, you have hundreds or thousands of youngsters from from north of our borders seeing South Africa as a as a stepping stone to those leagues. But in South Africa, we have to protect our own development interests and for that reason there's limited opportunities for for African footballers here so it's a it's a very difficult situation and uh, and when when desperation is is in the picture it's uh, it's easy for exploitation to happen Ibrahim Fakir uh, you made the point uh, earlier about the fact that uh, uh, so many African footballers are represented in Europe and we also have the problem as well of uh, and some people say satellite TV is 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 uh, mainly to or partly to blame for this uh, because of, because um, European football is so readily available around the world now uh, we have fans of, of Manchester United and Real Madrid and Barcelona all over the world including Africa uh, so we're, we're kind of spoilt for choice in our football because it's so readily available and that has had a negative impact on on the domestic leagues uh, in Africa. What can be done to stem that, do you think? Well, I wouldn't want to blame satellite TV because if we did, then we wouldn't be watching ourselves, no, would we? Uh, look, I think, I think that, you know, there's, there's both a boom and a bust when it comes to questions of access uh, and the ability of, of satellite TV to bring to you the big leagues of the world. For one, of course, it improves standards. It, it, it allows you to aspire to a different kind of standard. It allows you to copy and mirror what may be going on. It exposes you to different skills. It, it exposes you to different quality and level of football. So I think those are the, all the good things. The bad things are that, of course, it might have some impact on your domestic leagues because some of your best players don't, in fact, want to play in a domestic league. Now, that, as an individual, they're entitled to exercise that right. And if they get recruited by other clubs, then so be it. The reality is that football administrations, uh, uh, managers, agents, sponsors need to come to the party because if you're not creating those opportunities in the domestic leagues, then why blame individual players with the requisite skill who decide to go and ply their trade elsewhere. I mean, it's, 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 it's true for any worker who's, who's, who's going to be prepared to do that. So, you know, the onus here really is going to be on football administrators, on coaches, on sponsors and football managers for the way in which the leagues are managed, the way in which the sponsorship actually trickles down to not just the grassroots, but also benefits the players. And that's partly what's not going on, not just in South Africa, but worse still across the continent. You, you share that view, Keir Ridnich. It's, it's easy to look for, for outside scapegoats, but the investment has to come um, from within at the end of the day. Yeah, I, I also think that it comes down to quality of administration as well. Um, I think, you know, every uh, national association in the world receives a six-figure handout every year from the World Federation FIFA. Now, the question is, what happens to some of that money? I think one of the points that uh, needs to be taken on board is obviously you could keep players in some leagues for a year or two longer if the administration was better, if the uh, financial rewards were just that little bit better. I, th I think the problem is football is uh, a meritocracy and uh, you know, the best players will always want to go and, uh, and try their talent and, uh, and in the best places. It's, uh, you know, that's where the, the talent drain exists and uh, it's very, very difficult to, uh, to turn the tide around. You share that view, Carlos Amato, that uh, the Can local... I just interject there? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I just, on that point, it's interesting to say that uh, in, in South Africa at the moment that tide is being reversed because South African uh, PSL league salaries are rising to the point where they exceed those paid in, in leagues like Belgium and... Uh, 
and Scandinavia, which means that our players are in fact not leaving where beforehand they would have. Um, and that is actually having a negative impact on the development of a lot of players because they're not leaving at, at a time when their, their development could happen faster. So, so it's a double-edged sword. Um, our league is strong financially, um, but it's stagnating and a bit isolated precisely because it's, it's becoming wealthier. So there's a bit of a paradox there too. All right, well, let's get, a, let's get an idea then of, of what uh, some of our viewers have been saying uh, about this because we've been put it, posting this uh, question on our Facebook uh, page. And so let's give you uh, um, a sample of some of the reaction we've been getting on that. Charles uh, Damilora says, more funding to discover talent and improve management of football in respective countries, improve the quality of referees and officials. Babatunde Oladimeji Hassan, and uh, I hope you'll forgive me for uh, if I mispronounced his name there, if he's watching. He says, our football pitches, sports facilities should be of a higher standard. Players, coaches, managers, and sports administrators who know about the game should be encouraged to do more. Our domestic leagues need huge investment. So. Um, that pretty much uh, uh, echoes what, what we've been saying in this discussion so far. But do, do keep those uh, uh, Facebook uh, posts coming in, though. Um, if I could turn back to you, though, uh, Ibrahim Fakir, um, what would you say about the, the, the quality of the football uh, on the field that we've seen uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the African game and, 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 when, and, and big tournaments like uh, the Africa Cup of Nations? Has it evolved in the right way? Well, I think it has evolved, but if we look at this AFCON opener, I think it was a poor showing. Uh, it was mediocre football. Of course, the weather didn't help, but I think that's, that's, that's a pretty excuse. Uh, you know, I think there's been the development of, of, of the standard of the game. Certainly, uh, it improved as this particular tournament has gone along. Uh, pretty many of the games weren't as well attended as the football figures or the st attendance figures ought to have showed when they looked at whether the stadiums booked out or not. So, clearly, uh, you know, while the standard may have improved as the as the as the as the tournament carried on, the attendance figures didn't do so, and that's partly due to administrative and management problems. So, you know, again, if you look at the governance lessons, it's the oversight of what's going on, it's the oversight of the ticket, uh, ticketing system, it's the oversight of the outreach, communications, advertising, etc., to attract a greater number of fans. So, yes, the standard may have evolved, the standard may have improved, particularly as the tournament went along, but attendance figures unfortunately didn't. Hopefully, the final uh, will show much much better turnout. Kia Rednich, what do you make of the, of the standard of the football that we've seen in, in, in this tournament? Is it what you expected? Yes, I'm afraid it has been what I expected, but then I was, I was a little bit negative before it began. Um, I think one of the things that I've seen, particularly the uh, creativity I've, I've been missing and some of the defensive play, I think, you know, we tend to think sometimes and in past African championships that I've been to, We've thought that some of the, a lot of the European players have brought some of their, if you like, um, defensive and physical expertise back to the tournament, which was uh, negative. Um, this time, I'm not sure that it's moving forward the way that we'd, we'd like to see, because around the world, the game is becoming um, more creative and I think more positive. And that's not been reflected in what I've been able to what, see. Why, why do you think that Africa is? I mean, you so bring far. up an interesting point there. Why, why do you think it hasn't filtered to Africa? I don't know. I don't know whether that's down to the uh, the pressures of this particular tournament. Um, again, it is very difficult to sort of you know take one out for a, a particular example. But as I say, I think people looking from outside Africa were very disappointed with the uh, the role that the African teams did not play in the finals in South Africa, and I'm not sure that I see any uh, positive signs that things are improved since then. Carlos Amato, uh, how, would you, uh, how would you rate the, the, the type of football that we've seen in, in this tournament? And do you think unrealistic expectations have, have been placed on it? To some extent, I, I think it's been mixed. Um, there have been some good games, and some of the games have been, uh, have been affected by bad pitches, which do uh, inhibit uh, good passing football. Um, but I think also that the major teams have disappointed, with the exception of Nigeria, uh, Ghana and Ivory Coast, with so many top-class players, um, seem to have been under-motivated. And that's partially to do with the timing of the tournament, that it comes in the middle of the, of the European season. And it seems that uh, a lot of the very successful players don't take the tournament as seriously as they should. 
But on the other hand, a lot of smaller teams like Burkina Faso and Cape Verde um, gave it everything and announced themselves to the world in a very exciting way. So um, I think I think one shouldn't judge international football too too harshly in terms of cohesion mm-hmm. and and uh, instinctive passing moves. I think I think inevitably there's going to be a, a measure of 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 stuttering and and uh, and of uh, incohesion, if you'd like. Um, Ibrahim, so Ibrahim you have to judge Fakir, it uh, with that uh, in mind. Carlos brings up the point there that um, a lot of the the, the traditionally uh, uh, traditional powerhouses in in African football uh, have not made a stamp on this tournament, particularly from North Africa. Obviously, um, Egypt, uh, uh, seven-time winner, didn't even qualify, didn't qualify the tournament before that either. Um, in, in North Africa, teams in general um, haven't done well in this particular tournament. Why do you think that is? Well, I think, you know, we can squarely look at what's been going on in some of those countries politically. Uh, you know, I don't know to what extent that's affected the way in which players actually play on the pitch. Uh, but the reality is that those are relatively well-developed leagues. I mean, the Egyptian clubs, uh, at least in the domestic level and on the continent, are very well known, known for good football, known for creative football, known for high-speed football in some cases. Uh, and I think have been very lackluster, partly because I think they're severely affected by the political goings-on of what's going on. Uh, and if you think about what's happened uh, between the supporters' clubs uh, in Port Said, I think that has affected the players, has had a dampening effect in the way in which they do so. But, you know, the reality is also that many of the players don't take this tournament as seriously as they ought to. Uh, so it doesn't have the prominence that other tournaments across the world have. Have you seen that, Keir Rednich, that um, a lot of the, uh, the top professional uh, African players don't seem to take uh, this tournament uh, as seriously as, as in the past? Because uh, partly perhaps it, it, it happens in the middle of, of, of the uh, European football season? No, I, th- I think that's a, a slightly dangerous generalisation because certainly out of the Premier League, we've seen quite a number of uh, top African players, you know, who have basically said to their clubs, listen, you know, whatever's going on in the Premier League, we intend to go and play in the African Cup of Nations. You know, they've, they've made a point of forcing their way out. So, uh, you know, there, there has been commitment there. I think then you come back to the, uh, the old topic about how those players then mix in with some of the players from the other leagues and some of the players, you know, back from their home countries because obviously this has been an issue in terms of team cohesion and teamwork and team spirit in the past. Well, uh, I want to ask you as well, Ibrahim made the point there about uh, the, 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 the political and social upheaval that we've seen in North Africa over the last couple of years. Um, is there a link there between the fact that they haven't performed as, as well in, in uh, recent tournaments? Um, I'm not sure that there is so much. I mean, obviously, Egypt is a case all of its own. Um, I think with some of the other North African countries, I think some of them sort of come and go in terms of their strengths and weaknesses and uh, in terms of the management of their teams and in terms of a lack of, uh, of cohesion in team selection and team building. But I think also, you know, quite a number of the teams rely on a number of European-based players. So, you know, really, their, uh, their performances right. have been uh, very disappointing. All right, we've, 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 we've got just under a minute left, and I know I, I did uh, ask you this uh, before, we, uh, before we went on the air. I want to ask you, all three of you, what are your predictions then for the final on Sunday? Who do you think is going to win, Nigeria or Burkina Faso? Uh, Carlos Amato. I'm sensing a, a 3-2 victory for Nigeria. Um, with uh, Jonathan Petroipa scoring a goal to celebrate the fact that he's allowed to play in the final despite his uh, unjust right. yellow card. The other All right, night. Ibrahim Fakir. As a patriotic South African, I think I have to keep silent. But, you know, also as a patriotic South African, I have to support the underdog. So I'm going to go for Burkina Faso. But, you know, really, I think at the end, the society wins. FCON hasn't been as high profile as the World Cup uh, in 2010. But the society will be left with some infrastructure, the creation of some jobs, uh, short term as they might be. But, you know, so I think that's the winner. Kia Rednich, who do you like? Um, I like favourites, Nigeria. But uh, but I hope it's in extra time. I hope it's about 4-3. All right, so two for Nigeria, one for uh, Burkina Faso. We'll find out uh, on Sunday. Hopefully it'll be a good final. Thank you to all of our guests, uh, Carlos Amato, Kia Rednich, and Ibrahim Fakir. And thank you for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. Remember, if you want to send us your feedback, just email your thoughts to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. I'm Hazem Seeker. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.